Okay. Thank you, Galen. Um, I don't see a share. Yes, I do. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Host to say. <laughs> I apologize about that. So we aren't ready to go. Hang on. Yeah, okay. You should be good to go now. Okay, and let me get this on slideshow. All right. Um, so as, as Galen said, this is our last one. And as we go along today, I want to remind you that this is from the point of view of an ecologist looking at your yard and garden as an ecosystem. So um, you have to understand my point of view is not just the plants and the plant nutrients, but the ecosystem as a whole. So there should be time for questions if you have any questions at the end. And I will remember after class to check my CNU email. I did get on it and I did check it uh, last week and I forgot in between, but I will do it again. Okay, so what, according to Barb Abraham, is an environmentally sustainable garden and yard? And then specifically what to do and what not to do for good garden bugs. Okay, so you can find different definitions of environmentally sustainable, but I like this one in particular being an ecologist uh, is to maintain an ecological balance in your garden's natural environment, regardless of how many horticultural varieties or non-native plants you have, you want to strive toward having a balanced ecosystem there. So not only are you trying to not exhaust your soil nutrients, but you're trying not to cause any damage to the ecosystem as a whole, for example, with pesticides, fertilizing at the wrong time of year so that it all washes off and eventually goes into the Chesapeake Bay and the ocean or whatever. Okay, so today we'll talk then about what not to do for your good garden bugs, which are an important part of your home ecosystem, and also what to do uh, for the good garden bugs. bugs. <laughs> okay, so remember that my take on pesticides may be a little bit different than the master gardener materials. I'm very anti-pesticide being an ecologist and an entomologist, and you're getting my point of view. Uh, I'm also not a very good gardener because my plants have to survive my bugs. I won't kill the bugs no matter what unless I can pick them off my hand and squash them. Remember that pesticides is a general term which does include the insecticides but also the herbicides and fungicides which as more people are studying them uh, some of them are synergistic with the insecticides and can harm um, the good garden bugs directly, although mostly the herbicides are killing off pollinator habitat and habitat for good garden bugs because they use the weeds. Um, so getting rid of the weeds is not a good idea. In your garden, of course it is, but for example, if you had a large agricultural field or a wildflower meadow, you would want to use some of those things that are called weeds because pollinators, the predators and the parasitoids use a lot of them, the pollen of those plants or the plants themselves as habitat uh, nest sites, for example. Um, and so you don't wanna try and get rid of all the non-native and exotic plants, particularly in your yard. If you have a lot of turf grass, those dandelions are wonderful food for pollinators. Bumblebees love dandelions. All kinds of things love clover. So I am, uh, if I were a purist, I would say I don't want to see any yards or gardens that don't have any non-native or exotic plants in them. That's a pretty extreme view. I guess we probably, almost all of us would have some non-native or exotic and those are equivalent terms, plants in our garden. Uh, so what should we do on the positive side? And I'm going to go into all of this in more detail, obviously. 
but what should we do? So you know that you should have a diversity of pollen sources for your pollinators uh, and also some of the uh, parasitoids and predators that use pollen. You should try to plant as many natives as you can because that is what the native bugs that we want to have in our gardens uh, are evolved to use. And of course, you know that you should have things that bloom through the seasons if you're trying to support the good garden bugs. And as I said, this whole thing is slanted toward the good garden bugs and their functions in the ecosystem. So some of these things, if you're just wanting to have a summer garden, won't really apply. We'll talk a little bit more about shelter and nesting places. We haven't really addressed that yet. And we'll talk about the water needs because bugs need water just like we do. Okay, so here's my take on insecticides. Obviously, if you have plants that you do not want bugs to eat up, you and IPM has not worked for you, then you, you're gonna wanna use something organic that is the least toxic thing that you can find on your plants. I've used insecticides twice in my life. Both times I had a very bad result for different reasons. The first time I had a tree that had a wound around the bottom and the then extension agent who wasn't Galen told me to put this stuff in the soil and the tree would take it up in its roots and it would kill all the bugs that were sucking on the tree or chewing on the tree. Well, I, I did what was suggested and all my earthworms came up to the surface and thrashed around and died. And then I had to wonder about how many birds I had killed. Um, so that was my first experience with pesticides. The second one was when I had some wasps, colonial wasps, social wasps, making nests between my bamboo shades and my jalousied windows on my porch. And it was really all the way around this large porch. I mean, there must have been more than half a dozen nests. And so I got one of those spray cans and it sprayed so hard that it's the first thing that happened was it splashed back in my face. So I am not, <laughs> I am not going to ever use pesticides again for any reason, but I am not enough of a gardener to, you know, cry real hard if I lose a plant. I have a, uh, an overgrown holly bush right now that's going by the wayside slowly, and all I'm doing is pruning off the dead parts as it goes. So this is my personal uh, take. Integrated pest management uses pesticides as a last resort if the other things that we have talked about, the cultural, the biological, and the specific chemical like um, insect growth regulators don't work. Okay, so why do I have this kind of extreme view on insecticides and other pesticides? Because they kill the, all the good guys. Um, 99% of our chemicals that we use for insect pests will kill any insect that it comes uh, in, in touch with. And it also will run off, sorry, I should have put this for number two. And it will run off into aquatic systems and kill arthropods there because arthropods um, physiology is pretty much the same. So if it kills an insect, it's very likely to kill some of those small arthropods, little shrimp-like creatures and daphnias and all kinds of things in the water. Uh, also keep in mind that when you're looking at food chains, because each predator eats more than one herbivore, that means that it's getting all of those pesticides if they're in the body of the herbivore so that the predators get a lot more poison than the herbivores, and you're going to be much more effective unless you have something that's specific, like some of the things for white grubs. Um, unless you get a specific uh, insecticide, you're killing off more of the good guys than you are of the bad guys, because they're getting a higher dose. Uh, now, this is perhaps a, the largest problem. It, it's the same as antibiotic resistance, the more we use something, the more what we're using it against is able to evolve resistance. And there really isn't enough time to, to go into this in much detail. But just be aware that if you're using the same insecticide over and over in your garden, 
that the pests that you're killing were the susceptible ones, but there are always, because insects have large populations, and hopefully your level of tolerance isn't so low that if you have one of something, you're spraying it um, outside your house, of course. Uh, so you're, you're fostering pesticide resistance. And if your neighbor's doing the same thing and their neighbor, then that's why we have so many insects that are uh, resistant and you can't kill them with certain pesticides anymore. Uh, the boll weevil, for example, I think is resistant to about 10 or more insecticides. Um, and also you have to keep in mind that if you're a birder, that one, one treated seed with some of these insecticides will kill something the size of a chickadee, just one. Um, and of course, children and pets and other wildlife that you might not want to kill off are also susceptible. One seed probably wouldn't do it, or maybe walking through your yard. But I notice they're going to spray for mosquitoes at Langley, and they say it's not harmful to wildlife or children unless you have allergies or asthma, something like that. Um, one time it went over my head when I was in a garden at HU, you know, 300 feet, I think they, they fly at, and it sprayed us as we were out there weeding in the butterfly garden. Um, so I'm, I'm not happy about that either, but mosquitoes are no fun either, so I won't get on that. So let me say my piece one more time about neonics. I found this press release from the EPA um, online, and I've given you the link here if you want to go directly to that, and that, as I recall, has a link to the actual report, which is quite long. But so the EPA evaluated three of the neonics, and this is some of the things that they found. They evaluated the effects on a large number of listed species and their habitats, and these are the three uh, neonics that were analyzed and what the results were, you can see that in all cases, it's well over half. Um, this is, I think, the most highly used one, and I stumble over saying the word every time. Um, but what you're looking at is a very negative effect on species uh, and also ecosystems from using neonicotinoids. And remember that when you buy something in the nursery, the seeds may have been treated before the plants were grown. So unless you see something on the label or you're, the person you're dealing with at the nursery is knowledgeable, you don't know if that pollen when the plant grows and that nectar are gonna be poisoned. Okay, so here's, here's the wildlife likely harm 70 species of mammals and 77 bird species. And this is not from spraying for mosquitoes, okay? This is, this is from um, spraying on plants or treating the seeds and then the plant grows up with this pesticide in it. This is a cartoon that I got quite a long time ago because I thought it was, it, it's actually quite sad. But what happens with the neonics is that it's neurotoxic. So it affects their nervous system. And like I said, the physiology of all arthropods is similar enough that it will affect all the insects and other arthropods as well. When you look at most studies, the one I just showed you, it's not true of, but when you look at most studies, what is analyzed in terms of pollinators is honeybees. So we don't have a toxicity level for bumblebees. And I'm going to show you some terrible photos here uh, of bumblebee die-offs. This was the first one that came to light, I think, that made national news in 2013. Um, and so this was Safari, which has a neonic in it. And it was blamed in the death of 50,000 bumblebees in Oregon. And that data, as well as the photo, comes from the Xerces Society. Um, Bee City is an offshoot of the Xerces Society, so they're a very reliable source for information about pollinators. 
And then in 2018, we had the same thing in Ruston, Virginia. Sam Drogi, I may have mentioned his name before. He is Mr. Uh, B for Virginia and pretty much all of the Southeast. And this European, the European linden trees, uh, when they bloom, they do get a large number of bees and other insects. And so this is the number of bumblebees alone, these species of bumblebees that were killed. And then the carpenter bee, the honeybees, some of the leaf cutter bees and the andranids, and this is a longhorned bee, make up the, the rest of that. One tree that was sprayed with a neonic uh, while it was blooming. Okay, so you've all heard of honeybees decreasing from colony collapse disorder. Nobody has really nailed down the cause of it, probably because there are multiple causes. So we know that diseases, and I haven't listed any of them here, but honeybees, because they live in a close space, they live in colonies, are susceptible to transmitting diseases among one another. And then there are these varroa mites and there are other mites. And the more abundant the mites are, the more um, abundant the diseases are, of course, the more honeybees are going to die. The interesting thing about colony collapse disorder is that you don't see dead bees. They leave the hive for their foraging trips and they just don't return. And one of the things that we know about some pesticides is that they don't necessarily kill bees directly, but what they can do is interfere with their homing ability. So some of this colony collapse disorder is undoubtedly due to mites and diseases, and some of it is undoubtedly due to pesticides. So you're having multiple causes. Now for honeybees in particular, um, migratory operations where they, they throw these hives on semi-trailer trucks and drive them across the country to pollinate the almonds in California or whatever. Um, I have read something from someone who drove behind one of these semis and had honeybees just splatting on his windshield on, on the superhighway. So again, that, you know, that stress of that strong wind from that open uh, semi-trailer truck and being moved and you know having completely different food source all of a sudden isn't very good for them. Most of these refer to all bees, not just honeybees. Colony collapse disorder is honeybees. The diseases of honeybees now they're showing can be transmitted to other bees that use the same flowers. So, uh, and the migratory operations is just honeybees. The pesticides definitely isn't weather extremes, like all these rainstorms that we're getting, uh, you know, bees that nest in the ground are not protected by hives and, and by beekeepers, uh, and some of them may get rained out. Climate change changing the temperatures at which the flowers bloom and therefore are available to these native bees that have a very short lifespan, time to the flowers. What ecologists are finding is that there's frequently a disjunct now between the time that the bee is mature and flying around uh, trying to set up a nest and raise young and the time the flowers that it needs are blooming. So part of that then leads into number five, but part of it, of course, uh, part of the lack of adequate forage has to do with uh, development and agriculture. And I put nutrition in there because Although you may have a huge farm field of something blooming that the bees can use, before and after they have to have something else. And while it's blooming, it's probably taken the place of a diverse um, meadow type ecosystem that had different flowers with different amino acids and other things that the bees needed. So remember that bees do need more than one particular kind of flower at a time for their nutrition. Uh, another problem that ecologists have seen is that some beekeepers, the ones that are probably moving their bees around, so they have large numbers of, of colonies or hives, they will pasture them on public lands 
when the crops are not in bloom. So when the crops are in bloom, then they can get paid for taking their honeybees to the almonds or whatever to pollinate them. Um, and when nothing's blooming for those bees to use, the bees have to survive or the beekeepers would have to start over. So they, they pasture them somewhere where something is going on for them to survive the off season. And uh, there has been a lot of recent research on competition uh, because honeybees have such large numbers, you know, we're talking 50,000 bees and native bees usually is more, um, the only colonial ones that have large numbers are bumblebees and they only have about 500. In, in a hive, in a nest, I should say. They're not called hives with native bees. And all the solitary bees, of course, will not have that large of a population. So if you have this influx of honeybees, then you obviously are cutting down on the food for the native bees. So what are you gonna do at home? Uh, obviously, you're gonna consider using integrated pest management where you're gonna set your personal tolerance limit. Uh, whether it's for, I don't want the leaf cutter bees cutting holes out of my leaves, or I don't want the Japanese beetles eating them, or you're looking at your crop of tomatoes or whatever, that would be the economic, whether or not you're selling them at the farmer's market. So you know what your plants are. Uh, you want to research the pest to see what time of year it's active. We talked about cultural methods of trying to time planting when you didn't have very little plants, young plants that pe certain pests would like to eat, et cetera. So you're gonna research different control methods for the pest when it reaches your tolerance limit, not when you see the first one. Well, you can research it at any time, of course, but you don't wanna use it until it reaches your tolerance or exceeds your tolerance limit. So you can use the mechanical, you can use the cultural, uh, and the biological, remember that the first rule of biological control is not killing the good garden bugs that are already there. You don't have to import ladybugs uh, to kill your aphids if you've already got a lot of ladybugs in your yard, for example. And use as specific as specific as you can if you get down to the point where you insist that you need a chemical control. And of course, avoid spraying your neighbor's yard. I put that in there because I have a friend who has an above the ground fish pond on her patio and somebody killed her fish one time by spraying pesticides next door, probably when it was a little bit too breezy. And I just put that in there for some interest because I haven't been showing you a lot of pretty pictures. Okay, so what, what are you gonna do about weeds? Weeds, remember, are just plants where we don't want them. So I'm not trying to talk you out of weeding your flower or vegetable garden, but remember the intercropping principle where if you leave some things that the pests prefer, and you can find that out by watching, um, then you won't have as much damage to the plants that you do want. But yes, go ahead and weed your gardens. Um, remember that these weeds are food sources for pollinators and some of the predators, especially during the early spring. I once saw a bumblebee on a flower so small that it was practically bending it down to the ground. So they really use some of these little tiny weeds, these spring ephemerals that come out. Uh, remember that herbicides, while they're not always killing um, the good bugs, they're certainly killing some of their food sources and that they wash into the systems. And remember that you can also use IPM for weeds. So you might want to Google some of that. I'm not going to go into that in detail. I found this online. Uh, people hate this purple dead nettle, but bumblebees love it. So if you leave that somewhere in your yard, not between your flowers necessarily or in your vegetable garden, and I don't know why anybody would consider a, a violet to be a weed, but, but people do. So here's a big long list of just ones with purple flowers that are common. Burdock is not for everybody for sure. Um, 
But I just thought that might be of interest to you. Remember, a weed is just a plant where we don't want it. Here's a picture of some of them. I wanted to show you both the hand bit and the dead nettle, the hand bit in the upper left, the dead nettle in the lower right, because people have trouble telling them apart. But really, uh, they're not that hard to tell apart. Okay. Um, so here is a picture showing you the hand bit. It, look at the scallops on the leaves. They really don't look anything like the leaves on the dead nettle. The flowers can be a little harder, but the hand bit are more, tend more to be up at the top and the dead nettle can be between the leaves as well. And here's a picture of violets in somebody's yard. I have a lot of these and I foster them. And yes, they will spread. And dandelions. Uh, uh, my environmentalism and certainly my ecology, uh, when I when I did my PhD, which is what my PhD is in, uh, changed how I look at the natural world. So I used to dig up dandelions, even when I moved into my house in 1997. Uh, it was the first yard I'd ever owned. So I was digging up dandelions. And then I started doing some research over at Mountain Lake Biological Station. And I found that the bumblebees love the dandelions. And I should have known better even before that, but unfortunately I didn't. So leaving, leaving your dandelions in that dead zone of turf grass is not a bad idea if you're interested in pollinators. Milkweeds. Uh, I think everybody knows about monarchs and milkweeds. They are used by other insects as well. Remember that insects will drink nectar from a large number of different kinds of plants. They are not limited by what kind of nectar they will drink, but it's only the monarch caterpillars that are limited to the milkweed. So they will only survive. I mean, if you put them in a jar with only something else, they would probably try to eat it, but they would not survive. They are adapted to the, um, the milkweed, but please the native milkweeds, okay? So the milkweed of not, the chemistry of non-native milkweeds is bound to be a little bit different. So uh, if you're interested in monarch butterflies, please plant only native milkweeds. And as you can see, there's quite a variety. The common milkweed is the big one with the big leaves. Uh, I have a lot of butterfly weed. They can be small if, if they're competing with something else. Um, swamp milkweed, you need a little bit more moisture. But there are a large number of them. And if you're really interested in horticulture, and if you're interested in monarch butterflies or other butterflies in general, planting a bunch of different milkweeds is a great way to go. Okay, so non-native plants. Some are invasive. Here's a butterfly bush. Some people love butterfly bushes and say that they're not invasive on their property. Well, if you've got them in a lawn uh, and you're mowing your lawn regularly, of course they're not going to be invasive because there's no place for them to grow up. You're mowing them off. But here are all the places in 2011 that they were considered to be invasive. Okay, and one of the problems with invasiveness, I mean, it's pretty, why wouldn't we want it to be everywhere, like our crepe myrtles, which are also non-native, uh, is that it can outcompete natives. So what you do when you plant exotic species that get out into the wild, as this one did, is that they can destroy the natural ecosystem in terms of first outcompeting the plants, which means that now the native insects have either got to feed on something they're not uh, physiologically adapted to or starve to death and die and go extinct. So uh, remember that your butterfly bush does not support specialist native bees and it is not the host of any caterpillar of a native species of butterfly or moth. So yeah, the, the adults will drink from it but it does not help them maintain their populations at all unless you know, you've got other plants that they can, the caterpillars can eat. 
Okay, so here's the master gardeners of Northern Virginia listed these as native plants. How many of you have Nandinas in their yard? I still have some, although I've tried to get rid of most of them. And I do cut off the berries uh, in the winter because they are toxic to birds. I love the scent of the Japanese honeysuckle, but I did get rid of it because it is invasive. I didn't know Rosa Sharon was invasive. The city took care of it by cutting it all down on my median. Um, daylilies, I have daylilies. My next door neighbor has the, um, what is this thing? Mimosa. Tree of heaven, is that what it's called? And certainly I have a lot of liriope and it does spread and bees will use it, but again, only for nectar. Can't you? Somebody isn't muted. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And again, I have vinca. I bought an old, a very old house and every plant, every plant was non-native. Uh, bush ivy, big problem. Burning bush is gorgeous. I don't have any of those in my yard. Okay, so diverse native plantings that bloom through the seasons. Social bees need food longer than you would ever dream that they need it. Bumblebees will be out when you think it's too cold for them to be out. And most of our flowers flower in a relatively short period of time. Unless you have Lenten rose, nothing's really blooming in the winter. Um, so try to have, if you're interested in supporting the good garden bugs, particularly pollinators, uh, try to have things that bloom all the way from the very early spring to the very late fall at the least. And remember that in terms of most native bees, they're solitary and they live only a short time. Uh, and so you, you need to have some plants when they're alive. And this is particularly important in the early spring. They also don't fly very far. So if your neighbor has something and you don't, you may or may not have any of these bees in your yard because they're going to nest by where their food source is. Uh, okay. And don't forget trees and shrubs because um, they do have a lot of pollen particularly in the early spring. There are willow specialists, for example. I don't believe that weeping willow has anything for them. That again, I believe is non-native. Okay, so what should you do in your own garden? Plant clusters rather than specimen plants. Not only can they find it more easily, but of course it's a bigger source of food if that is a native plant. Uh, think about your whole yard. Don't forget that the trees and shrubs that are native are very important. Uh, and then native, some of the native grasses can actually be used by bees, the pollen. If you're allergic to bee stings, you can plant red trumpet-shaped flowers that attract butterflies and hummingbirds. So if you say, I don't want any bees on my property, just focus on red. Uh, bees will still come, but not as many of them by far. Uh, and remember, I showed you short-tongued and long-tongued bees. So the longer the corolla tube on a, on a flower that has elongate flowers, the longer the tongue of the bee has to be to get that nectar. Now, there are some nectar robbers that will chew at the base of the flower to get at the nectaries. And it's not just carpenter bees. Honeybees can do that. Bumblebees can do that um, if they don't have a tongue that's long enough to reach to the nectar. But that's not very common. I've never really seen it in nature, and I've studied bees for about 10 or 15 years. And then if you're interested in planting plants that bees specialize on, there is a list from the native, the Virginia Native Plant Society, and I've put that link on this slide. Okay, so beyond feeding them, 70% of them are going to nest in the ground. They are not going to nest in mulch, obviously not landscape fabric. So you want to leave a little bit of bare ground in a sunny area for them, particularly if it's a sandy area, not a solid clay. Um, the native grasses, the bunch grasses, 
can not only provide shelter, say in that rainstorm that we had last night, and but they're also something's nest in the stems. Okay, so don't till your bee nesting area. It should be in a sunny spot, sandy, loamy, well drained, and in your yard with the food. And here's an example of Andrena, the one of the mining bees. And this particular one was in a baseball field in an elementary school. And all of these that look like anthills are actually um, the dirt that has the soil that has been brought up out of the tunnel of a mining bee. And here's a mining bee with a lot of pollen on its legs. Okay, leave the leaves. I think it was the National Geographic Society or possibly Audubon that started this. Uh, an awful lot of moths nest on the ground. And of course, a lot of predatory, um, not nest on the ground, I'm sorry. They have their pupil stage underground or attached to leaves, you know, the chrysalis. Um, and a lot of other insects are either in that litter layer or just below it. And when you mow, you're going to kill a lot of things. If you rake everything up, you're going to be raking a lot of good garden bugs. Don't clean your garden. I'll have another slide on that. How am I doing? Okay. Um, pithy stems, so like raspberry or blackberry, whatever, uh, but also some of the grasses and the, the um, cup plant that I have is supposed to be a really good source, although I have never found any entrance holes. 30% um, of them nest in cavities, but remember that most of them do nest in the ground. So uh, the next slide, I don't know if this person put that yard waste there on purpose, but that looks like an accident waiting to happen to me. I can only hope that their air conditioner unit is brand new and that they're never gonna have to have a workman back there because that's a perfect place for all kinds of uh, vertebrates, snakes, mice, as well as bumblebees, which like to be close to the ground under something. Somebody called me one time, had left some yard waste on their driveway and it must've been dirt, the part of the driveway that they left it on must've been uh, soil not concrete because I don't think the bumblebees would have nested on concrete even with the pile this big. Has uh, he dropped something there? Say what? Sorry, Loy. Okay, so do leave a pile like this. Brush piles are recommended for many kinds of wildlife, but don't put it that close to your house and certainly not right next to your air conditioning unit. So here's showing. Um, a ground nesting bee with four parts to their nest. And so this is the pollen ball with the egg. Here's a young larva, an older larva, which has eaten most of its pollen and nectar ball. And then this is the pupa that doesn't eat anything anymore. And so these then will emerge out of the ground at a particular time of year, depending on the species. And here's showing you a hollow stem I don't know what that is a stem of, but I'll show you some pictures of what you can use. This black stuff is frass, that's caterpillar poop or other kind of bug poop. But here's a smaller one, a larger one. That's probably just a pollen ball that didn't get eaten. So that egg may have died. And then here's a pupa of a cavity nesting bee. Remember complete metamorphosis. Um, Nancy Adamson that I told you about earlier took this picture of a cavity nesting bee. This is probably a small carpenter bee. They're very pretty, but they're very tiny. And these holes in the stump were probably made by beetles, but bees will use these holes once the beetle is out of there. So uh, I always wondered, when are you supposed to clean up your garden? When are you supposed to take all those dead stems out and whatnot? So the, the Xerces Society has some recommendations. If it's time to plant tomatoes, it's probably okay to mow your grass and rake your leaves and whatever, at least as far as bees are concerned. Um, if you could wait until the apple trees are no longer blooming, then you're really have done a good job. 
So some of them don't emerge until late May. So the longer you can wait to, um, to clean up your garden, the better off the good bugs are. And here's um, a diagram of that. So here is uh, when things are blooming in general, uh, these particular species. Here are, these bars are showing you the, um, the time when these bees are, are active adults and actually need the food source. And this is generalized for the Eastern US. So it may be a little bit earlier for us, uh, particularly with, with uh, climate change. And here's something the Xerces Society has. And if you just Google Xerces Society, you'll get to them. If you Google Bee City USA, you'll get to them as well. Uh, but here's telling you what to do with your purple cone flowers and other flowers in your garden in order to provide habitat for stem nesting bees. Okay, so a lot of people want to have the mason bee houses and there are lots of different kinds. I'm gonna show you a few pictures. Please remember, if you have one of these bee houses, you can't just put it up and leave it there, okay? You have to clean out each of those openings every year. Otherwise, you're going to get parasitoids um, coming from the ones that they have parasitized in your bee houses. And also remember that different kinds of bees require different sized holes. So here's somebody who's using bamboo and using, if you look, you can see there are different sizes of holes in this bamboo. And so what you do is you just throw them away uh, after the bees have emerged in the spring and put up a new one. And here are some commercially available bee houses. Somebody bought me one of these and I gave it away um, because I don't use them. They're the very simple ones, very complex ones. And if anybody has ever seen a butterfly go into any of these, that's what those are for is for butterflies. I, I don't believe that they use them, but if you know different, please let me know, perhaps in the chat. Okay, so you should worry about bees. I have told everybody I think about my uh, master gardener neighbor who lives around the corner for me one year, and I won't say her name here, <laughs> one year she got a couple of hives from I think the colonial beekeepers and she was keeping them in her backyard. And it was a really dry summer that summer. And I would go out in my bird bath, which was not concrete, but some kind of rough artificial stone or something, would have honeybees all the way around it, head down, drinking the water. It didn't bother me that the bees were drinking the water, but the birds wouldn't go to the bird bath. So what I did was I did what you're always told to do. I made some bowls, put some marbles or rocks actually in them, fill the water up to the rocks so the bees would have a place to stand and drink. Never used it. They preferred the bird bath. And also I have never seen any other kind of bees using those little bee bowls or the bird baths. Uh, other people that I know of have more luck than I did with the bee bowls, but they do drink water in dry um, times. Honey bees evidently spit out the water in the hive and then fan their wings to cool the hive. And that water helps by evaporation to cool the hive. If you have um, a water source, I guess I should see about getting my picture and putting it on here. Uh, I have raccoons that will climb up into that tall bird bath and just lay there. And I've, I've had that happen a couple of different times. So if you have other backyard wildlife, they may use your water source as well. Here are some of these bee bowls. This one is particularly interesting, although you certainly would have to refill that every day in, in a hot summer like, like this one. But those are all, again, commercially available and lots of other different kinds. The Etsy ones are probably handmade. I don't know about the Amazon ones. That looks pretty uh, manufactured to me. Okay, so habitat loss. If your entire yard is turf grass, you're not doing anything for pollinators. 
Um, so if you have a garden of any kind, then that's going to help them. Habitat loss is considered to be the most important factor in decreases of not only pollinator populations, but pretty much any species that uses the natural environment, which is all of them. Um, if you destroy their habitat, they're either gonna go somewhere else if they can, uh, like when you build a new shopping center, or if they're small things, then they're just gonna die out. Uh, so this is not just pollinators or good garden bugs. This is all the way up to the deer that can get trapped in an area that doesn't have enough food for them due to development. Uh, so cities, roads, but also our mechanized agriculture. When we plant huge fields of something, uh, it's great food source if, it, if it's, you know, something that blooms, grass blooms, but it's not. Um, used by our native bees. But even alfalfa is a wonderful bee food while it's growing. But what has happened with mechanized agriculture is you need room to turn around these huge farm machines and you don't want to be turning around on top of the crop. So all of the hedgerows have been destroyed pretty much on the large uh, agri um, industrialized agricultural fields. The family farm fields may still have some hedgerows, particularly if it's someone who's environmentally conscious. Um, but you need to have uh, something for the bees, which you don't have with monocultures when the monoculture isn't blooming. And we have plenty of studies now, both in Europe and in this country, documenting decreases in native bee populations due to habitat loss, but also pesticides, comp um, competing exotic species, et cetera. So I think this is my last slide. Uh, this is a pollinator, raised pollinator bed that I found online. And you can change the shape of it, of course, and you can put different plants, but these are all, I think these are all natives. If anybody sees something that's not native, you can tell me. Uh, so I did not, um, I did not put the references on this one because it was more than a page. And right after we're done here, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I don't want to exit yet. I don't know if I did it so I couldn't see the chat. Um, Galen, what did I do? Let me go. I wonder if I can go back. No. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm done. So there's plenty of time for questions. And if any of the, oh, here's the chat. Sorry. Show the chat. All right. So Gay, these are all from Galen, I think. Yes. Okay, so if you don't want to ask a question out loud, you can type it into the chat if you want to, uh, or if you don't want to, thank you for attending. And uh, this was our last session. Any questions? Looks like that's it, Barb. Thank you for a great series. We appreciate everybody attending. And um, if you have any questions, please contact uh, Dr. Abraham, or you may contact myself. And we'll see you um, at our next program, wherever it may be. Bye, everybody.